Testing, testing. Okay. Testing for Mark. Testing for Mark. Pay attention. There's a lag between what you hear and what actually the other room gets. There's about 20 seconds delay. So we're trying to make sure that the audio actually works. All right, let's get started. The other room appears to be able to see us today. Um, and this is our lecture four. Sorry, one second. Okay. So uh, one quick announcement, just to remind you of the available Math Help Center hours. Sorry. That There you go. I don't know why that one was off. Uh, Mass Help Center hours. So for the rest of the semester, these hours will apply with the exception of reading week. And you shouldn't be here on reading week anyway. Go home. So on Tuesdays, I have office hours right after this class from 1 to 2. On Wednesdays, I have office hours for two hours from 11 to 1. On Wednesdays, Melissa's in the Help Center from 12 to 1. So that overlaps a bit. Uh, on Thursday, RTA Sky is in the Help Center from 10 to 11. And on Thursday afternoons, one of the four graduate TAs will be in the Help Center from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Those are all hours you can use for help. In addition, a lot of you have kind of jumped into the Slack world quite aggressively, and that's great, talking back and forth and actually getting help from each other and from us. And it's, it's nice because it's asynchronous, but it's not email. This is not formal. You can just say, ask a question. Um, please, if you haven't used it yet, do scroll back through a few of the recent questions. Uh, the people who post a lot are starting to get in the rhythm of how you should ask a question. You need to provide context and effort. You can't just say, I don't understand this. Help me. Because that's useless because I don't know what this is or what sort of help you need. And if you send me a direct message on Slack saying, my login doesn't work, that's like, that's nice. What login? Which website? What group are you in? What section are you in? I don't know who you are. There's a lot of people in this class, and they all contact me. So if you are asking me something in a direct message, please give me a tiny bit of context so that I have an, an idea what you're asking. If you're asking for help on your homework, you need to have demonstrated you've at least tried. Not just, I'm completely lost. I understand nothing. Explain it to me. Be like, I tried this. It didn't work. Can someone explain where I went wrong? That's a good question. So please use it. It's there for you to use. And these help center hours and my office hours are there as well. So please use those and continue working hard on the course. So picking up from last day, we closed off with a quick plot, but it was at the end of the day and you were all getting very tired and hungry and you wanted to get out of here. And we were talking about this gender bias experiment that was run in the 70s. And so this is where we ended up with the simulations using software. And so we ran software instead. Uh, so that instead of having to deal out a bunch of cards from a deck over and over and over again, we say, computer, do it for me. And the computer does it for us. It runs 100 simulations. And you reproduced this experiment in your workshop. So if you didn't go to a workshop this week, you missed the first really cool workshop, I thought, in that you were able to create a document which did a full-fledged simulation in two hours. And that's actually the objective of this course, is to get you to the point where you are comfortable enough with the R Markdown environment and with R in general that you can do that for an arbitrary scientific experiment which we are all science majors of some sort. <coughs> Excuse me. So the goal is for you to be able to use this in your lab courses, to type up your lab reports, to do work on your theses, and so on, using this environment. So this is what the simulation showed. If we assumed that there was no difference between the promotion rate of men and women based on gender bias, and that the only thing that happened in this experiment was that the women in the pool got 
handed to the managers who were hard asses. This is what it would look like if we ran that as a simulation 100 times. And from that, we see that our original result lives out here. We saw a difference between the two promotion rates of 0 0.292, which is very much not something that we saw very often in the simulations. And in the simulations, really, we only saw a result that was that extreme two in a hundred times. And that's fairly rare. Just using your intuition about basic probability, that's rare. Two in a hundred, one in 50, that's not something that happens all the time. Obviously, it happens two in 100 times. So every 100 times you ran that experiment, only twice would you see a result that's like what the researchers saw with those bank managers. Which to us says that this is not a very plausible result by chance. If you're counting on that discrimination going away because, well, it might have been that two in 100 times, that's a very tenuous argument to make. It's not a very strong argument. And so in fact, it's a small enough number, two in 100, that we say that's actually very rare. And so we reject our null hypothesis, and we say there is evidence that gender discrimination against women in promotion decisions happened in this case. Now, go back two lectures, not last lecture, but the lecture before. What does that let us say about the world? No. We did talk about different biases, but we also talked about what it meant to be able to generalize your results. What population? Yeah, so this, this, is the, this is the problem. Remember that chart that ended the lecture two lectures ago where we have experiments and observational studies and we ask what it allows us to say about our results? If you don't remember, go back and check it out. It's actually a useful chart for, for sort of generalizing. Did we have randomization in the assignments in this case? Yes, we did. But did we have a randomly selected sample? No, it was a convenient sample. It was 48 bank managers who happened to be at a retreat. They were all bank managers, not general people on the street. What can we generalize to? We can say there was discrimination against women from bank managers in that group of 48 men. We cannot say that all people everywhere are discriminating against women. We cannot say that discrimination in promotion decisions happens in all fields. We cannot generalize to everything because the people that we experimented upon were not randomly selected from the population at large. Now, you could generalize this by randomly selecting managers across a number of different fields. And then you start to get a little more generalization. You can say, well, you, know, you don't want to sample everybody. I don't want to ask you or you because you're not managers. You're not promoting anybody. So your opinion sort of is irrelevant. What I want is the people who actually promote. Those are the ones that are interesting. And that determines not general gender bias, but gender discrimination against women in promotion decisions alone. Maybe fine in every other area of life. We know that. There's other issues. But we don't know anything more than just that in promotion decisions from these 48 men, there was gender discrimination. You have to be very, very careful in generalizing your results. The instinct, the human instinct, is that one point of data gets generalized to everything. Because that one point of data may be something very important, like tigers are in this area, and I should avoid these tigers so I don't die. And you know, so the human brain has been designed over millennia of sort of self-evolving evolution to look for patterns in data because patterns mean information and can be the difference between you surviving and not because tigers eat us. And so when we see patterns, we see something like this, we automatically overgeneralize and we assume this is true for everything that we've ever and ever will see. And you have to fight that because that's not actually true. Just because it happens once doesn't mean it's going to happen over and over again. Out of that logic, we get things like, you know, um, lightning and thunder, and clearly the, the thunder causes the lightning and, or vice versa, and you, you get causal inference that's not correct.
Okay, so that's the end of last lecture. I just wanted to quickly recap that. Uh, in the last workshop, number four, the one that you've all completed by now, uh, you implemented this study. That was the goal of that workshop. And if you followed this, the thing and you got through to the end, you implemented that study. And at the end, you would have seen a plot that looked very similar to what I just created. It wouldn't have been the dot plot because I just wanted to use a simple command for you. But you did get a histogram of the same results. In the next workshop, which overlaps the Thanksgiving weekend, you will be implementing the studies from today's lecture. And so this next workshop is all recap and review. There's no actual new me mechanisms in it. It's all stuff you've seen before, but we're implementing it on new studies. And we designed it that way because we know that about 50% of you aren't going to go to workshop this week. Either you'll leave early on Friday because you just want to get home for Thanksgiving, or you'll be on Thanksgiving on Monday and won't be here because the university is closed. So this workshop's kind of an optional workshop in the sense that there's no new information. You can totally do it on your own. I would not recommend you just skip it completely, like ignore the fact that it existed. Go if you are a Thursday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday t person, if that's when your workshop is. And if you're a Friday or a Monday, obviously make your call. Monday's no. Friday, if it's in the morning, you know, do it and then go home. But make sure you cover the material. Work through it on your own at some point this week. I'm going to post it late tomorrow. You'll have a whole week. Work through it before workshop six, because workshop six we pick up again, and we actually start to do new material based on what we did this week. All right? All right, another case study for you. Opportunity cost. This one's a bit more silly, but it's still very much a scientific study and was run. So we're interested in whether or not you, university students, as consumers, will always consider an obvious fact when you go to purchase things. If you don't spend the money today, you have the money tomorrow. And that money can be spent on something else. It's an obvious fact, yes, but do you stop yourself before you buy a coffee and go, if I don't spend this money on a coffee, I will have this money tomorrow to buy a coffee then, right? It, it's a bit silly, but this is behavioral economics. Like Things like this seem silly, but there's actually some subtleties here that you need to study. So we're curious whether reminding you of that fact before you choose to make a purchase has any impact whatsoever on your decision-making process and whether you actually buy the object. So the context, this study is a few years old, um, is on the next slide, but first the null hypothesis. If I remind you that you can save money, that has no impact whatsoever. Remember, the null hypothesis is always nothing's going on, nothing to see here, there's no change, there's no impact, there's no intervention, nothing actually happens. The alternative is that if I do remind you that you can save money, that will reduce the chance that you will actually go through with your purchase because you'll stop and go, all oh, right, I actually need to pay rent this month or something, and you'll avoid making this optional purchase. Now, it needs to be optional, obviously. If this is something you have to pay, if this is your rent, if this is your electricity bill, you don't just get to choose not to pay that. I mean, you can, but then they kick you out of your apartment, and that, that's kind of not fun. So it has to be something optional that you can live without. So they recruited 150 students. Uh, for the students, that should say sample, sorry. And each was given the following statement. Imagine you've been saving some extra money on the side. Okay, it's 15 bucks. You haven't really been saving dramatically for 15 bucks. But on your most recent visit to the video store, well, I guess HMV sort of still exists. You come across a special sale on a new DVD. This video is something you really wanted to get. You didn't see it in theaters. Apparently, streaming doesn't exist, and you just wanted to buy this DVD. All right. Again, this is a few years old. Context changes very quickly. This is one you've been thinking about buying for a long time. It's available for a special sale price of $15, including taxes. What would you do? Please circle one of the options below. And the options below are? 75 of the 150 students were given the options to buy this video or to not buy this video. So purely no context, I walk up to you, I say, you really want this video, you really want this DVD, you've got the 15 bucks in your pocket because you've been saving it, do you buy it? And you're like, why not, right? You know, I have the money and I want to buy it. You know, insert something you actually care about if you don't like videos, right? You know, maybe it's, maybe it's new, I was gonna say album, but I mean, CDs don't even exist anymore. So pick something you actually want which is a physical object, and buy it, or not. The other half of the class, the 75, were placed in the treatment group, and they saw, buy it, or do not buy it, comma, 
and keep the money for other purchases. And that was the only difference. 75 people were asked, buy it, don't buy it. The other 75 were asked, buy it, don't buy it, and save the money to use on something else. And obviously, the, you have to put, place yourself in the context of assuming this is actually something you do want. It's $15, yes, but it's something you do want. It's something, you know, maybe, maybe even you feel you need. And so do you buy it or not? And that's the only difference between them. So the question is, would that extra statement actually change the purchasing habits of the students? Here's the data. So in our control group, which was just said buy, don't buy, we had 56 of the 75 people said, yeah, sure, of course, I'll buy it. I got the money. I want it. Mine. In the treatment group, 41 of the 75 said, yes, buy it. And 34 said, no, I'd like to save the money. Whereas in the control group, the 19 said, no, just said, no, I don't want to buy it. They didn't know anything about saving money. So obviously, those results are a little bit different from one another. The question is, are they different enough that we believe that this is a statistically significant result and that we can infer from this that, in fact, it's the alternative hypothesis that the intervention worked? It changed minds. So absolute numbers is hard. Yes, the groups are the same size. And last week, we showed you mosaic plots and ways of visually kind of comparing these things. But really, what you want to do is you want to convert these into proportions, numbers out of one so that they are on the same scale and you can actually look at them. So if we do that, all we do is we take all the numbers that were in the table and these were divided by 75. So the old numbers were divided by 75 in order to get these and that takes the total, which was 75 and makes it one and so on. And we see that the control group 75% or 0.747 as a proportion chose to purchase, whereas in the treatment group, it was 0.547 or around 55%. So we've just converted the rows. And this immediately says, OK, 55 versus 75, those seem like a pretty big difference. So maybe there's actually something going on here. I mean, you can't ever trust your intuition. You always have to test it. But still, looking at that, we go, OK, maybe something's actually going on. So we define a success in the case of this experiment as meaning that the intervention worked. In other words, I said to you, you want to buy this. If you don't buy it, you will have the money tomorrow to spend on something else. That's the intervention. That worked. That's considered to be a success. Then the value of interest is the change in the purchase rates. So we take the purchase rates and if we go back up, What we're actually looking at is not the purchase rates, but the fail to purchase rates. So if you take a look at these, we want a success to mean a student doesn't buy the DVD, like I just said. So a success in this case is this column. So when we're looking at the difference in the rates, we're going to take treatment minus control, but we're going to use the column that represents the case that we consider to be a success. All it does is change the sign if you kind of flip the columns around. So we take the P treatment, the number of students from the treatment category who chose not to buy the DVD, that's 34 of them, over 75. And then we subtract from that the P control, which is the estimate of the proportion of the control group who chose not to buy the DVD, and that's 19 over 75. And those numbers we from the previous table are 0.453 and 0.252, and the difference is then 0 0.20. So that's 20% converted from a proportion. So it's 20% higher, which we already kind of knew. 20% more of the treatment group chose not to buy the DVD versus the control group. The question is, is this a statistically significant result? Is it big enough that we think that it is not plausible that this could have happened by chance. Let's find out. So simulation, again, if the null hypothesis was true and your intervention in reminding you that if you don't spend $15 today, you'll have $15 tomorrow, didn't do anything, then the difference would be entirely by chance. If the alternative is true, then in fact, 
that did impact the decision-making process of the treatment group, and those students did change their minds. In other words, that difference is due to minds being changed. We can assume that there's always a subset of the group who will just be like, no, I'm not going to spend the money. You know, they're thrifty. They save. They, they don't spend money on anything. They don't absolutely have to because of reasons. But then there will be that swayable part of the population. And the question is, did we sway people? Is that difference big enough that we are seeing the difference in sway? So how would we simulate this under the scenario? And this is always the case. So you're going to see this uh, in your workshop this week in the workshop handout. You always simulate under the assumption of the null. You set up your scenario, and it's always set up so the null hypothesis is what's going on, and that's how you simulate. And then you check where you are on the distributional curve, and that determines whether or not you reject. So this is very similar to the last one, but the last one we kind of cheated because we had 48, which was kind of similar to 52, and we could use a deck of cards, and it kind of could work out. We had face cards and non-face cards. This time, we don't have that, so let's just use blank cards. So we take little three by five cue cards, you know, the ones you learned your speech from in primary school, those ones, and we write buy or don't buy. How many times do we do that? We have 53 no buys and 97 buys. And where did those numbers come from? Jump back up to the original table. Those were our totals. So when you're setting up your simulation, you take your entire sample population, treatment and control, you lump them all into one category. Just like with our gender bias experiment where we took all 48 promotion decisions and we made our sample out of that. In this case, we take all 150 students who were in the survey and we use them. And of those, we had 53 students who said no and 97 who said yes. I now have 150 cards. And at this point, you're like, well, I don't even want to think about simulating this. Maybe a deck of cards, you got 48, okay, you can do that. 150, really? You're like, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 69, 70, 71, 72. Like, you're dealing cards. That sounds boring. But computers don't care, and that's what they're for. So we take those 150 cards, we shuffle them randomly, and we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 75, and then the rest go over here. Or if you really like... One, one, two, two, three, three, back and forth. And you end up with two stacks of 75 cards. Now, it's entirely arbitrary which is which. You just set it up beforehand so it's always the same for each simulation. That stack is my treatment stack. That stack is my control stack. Because remember, the null hypothesis is that the treatment and control are the same because your treatment does nothing. So we just randomly stack them into two stacks of 75. And then... We say, how many of these chose to not buy? How many of these chose to not buy? We find the difference. And you just have to label the treatment and control beforehand so that you know which is which. So here's an example of 75 buy or no buys chosen from a population of 53 no buys and 97 buys. And in this simulation, then this one-off simulation, the control group, which is this group that I've actually printed out to the screen, has 23 of the 75 saying, no, I would not like to purchase the DVD. I would like to save the money. The treatment group is not shown, but if you're logical and you think about it, I don't need to show it. I don't need to count it. How many no buys are in the treatment group? How many are the total? So there are 53 no buys total in my stack of 150. So if this stack has 23, how many are in the other stack? 30. Process of elimination, you just say 53 minus 23. So the difference then is that the treatment group has 30 divided by 75. And the control group has 23 divided by 75. And so 30 divided by 75 minus 23 divided by 75 is 0 0.093. <coughs> so in our first simulation, using these index cards, we get a difference between treatment and control of 0 0.093. Now our actual experiment had a difference of 0 0.2. What can we say about this? Absolutely nothing. This proves nothing. 
It's one off. If you are going to learn nothing else by the end of the semester, I'm going to hopefully drill into your heads that one point of anecdote is not data. It doesn't prove anything. It's one off. It could have been a fluke. But if we do this 100 times or 1,000 times or 10,000 times, and then we're getting There we go. Test, test. Yeah. Line. So yes, this is the control group. Control group is above. And from this big set, there are 23, and we count. And the treatment group, we don't need to count because we know how many are left over. Question? Uh, why do you do the 53 minus 23 again? We know there are 53 total no buys in our stack of 150. So if I have delta one stack and I count how many are there, I know by process of elimination how many are left. Oh, okay. So it's because you have I know how many are in the original. That's how. It's, it's the same as you know if you're playing poker. You know, have played poker or know of poker, and you're holding three aces, you know there's only one more ace out there somewhere, right? If we have 23 of the no buys, we know there are 30 of them out there because we know how many there are total. So that's where we get. So this is one simulation, one anecdotal piece of evidence. It's not worth much. But what if I do it again? Same thing. I run it a second time. And now I have 29 no buys in the control group, which leaves 24 in the treatment group, which gives me a difference of negative 0.067. In fact, it appears the treatment made people more likely to go off and buy the DVD. So if I tell you, if you don't spend the money today, you won't have it tomorrow, you go, I know, buy your DVD. So that's two. Again, still not enough. Let's ramp this up. And this is the whole point. Do it again, do it again, do it again. These results are now the differences. So notice the previous results that I spammed out from R were just the control groups. This is 175 simulations where we get numbers of positive 0.013, a 0.2, a 0.2, a negative, a negative, and so on, and so on, and so on. Obviously, this is not a nice way to present these results because we look at it, we're like, well, I can't tell how many there are of anything, and that is what plotting is for. So these are our results. So we have this simulation that we have run where we assume that your treatment had no effect and we just randomly distribute the results into the control group and into the treatment group. And when we do so, the differences between the treatment proportion of no buys and the control proportion of no buys is this set of numbers. Where are we? We are right in here. That's where we observed. So looking at that, how often would you see a result of 0.2 or larger just by entirely chance? So looking at this, we've run a whole bunch of simulations. How often would we actually see that by chance? Doesn't look like very often. You look at it, you're like, well, it's like maybe 
four or five, six, this may be like seven points. And this is a thousand points. So out of 1,000 simulations, there were seven times that we got a point two or larger as our result from this random chance. So if you're going to rely on your proof of evidence to say, well, it could have been one of those seven in a thousand times, that's not going to fly in a court of law and that doesn't work in a hypothesis test. You know, you can't say it's just entirely chance that a car with my license plate and my car color was driving down the street when the murder occurred. No, the judge is like, well, you know, there's only three of those cars in the city, the chances of one being on the street, it was probably you. So in this case, seven out of a thousand is not very common. It seems rare. And so we are going to conclude that we are going to reject the null. If we do this as a histogram instead, we get the similar kind of thing, but it just kind of clumps the results up together. You will notice, I don't know if you can see this, it's kind of hard, the human eye isn't really designed to see it, but you'll notice that there's no results where I'm putting the colors. See how those are actually blanks, not bars? That's because the difference between the two can only consist of 75 different values because they're always fractions out of 75. So you can get 1 75th, 2 75th, 3 75th, 4 75th, and so on, which means it's very discreet. And when you try and do a histogram, sometimes the bins overlap in a way that there's nothing in between them. And that's what's happening here, which is why the dot plot is sometimes a bit better for the display. So again, it looks like it's out on a tail. It looks extreme. So we would observe a difference of 0.2 or even larger less than 1 in 100 times. This is, again, quite rare. And so our conclusion is that the data do provide evidence of a treatment effect, reminding you that if you don't spend the money today on this optional purchase, you will have the money available tomorrow, does seem to influence your decision-making process. And they've done similar studies on, uh, you've all seen the, the commercials for Interact Flash? They play it before movies, they play it on TV and stuff like that. And then they, they're trying to promote the idea that you're using your money, not the bank's money, right? You're using Interact, not credit. And they've actually shown with studies that if you remind people of that fact before they tap out at a purchasing machine, uh, then it actually changes purchase habits. People do switch to using debit more often and, and not using credit. Just, they just need to be reminded that in fact, oh, this isn't my money. Is the habit is there, right? So the actual difference we saw was seven in a thousand times. If you rerun this, and I, I'm going to make you do that this week during the workshop, and you do it yourself, you won't see exactly the same number of results because it's random. And if you set a seed, a random seed at the start of your workshop, then you'll see the same result every time you run it. But if you don't, if you remove that, you'll get a slightly different result every single time you do this. And all you have to do to get it to be the same result, to be the, the exact value it should be, is run enough of them. Don't run just 1,000 times. Run 100,000 times. Then it starts to converge, and it's almost always the same. All right. Let's formally describe how to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a question. Um, when it seems to be part of the histogram or other part that we're using, um, can Okay, so the question is, like, where is the break point where you would change your mind? That, that, if I summarize what you've asked. And so here, we're out here on the tail. And so it seems to be very rare. Like, we only have seven out of a thousand of those simulations that were up as high as that one or higher. Your question is kind of, what happens if it's in there? Well, in that case, it looks like it happens all the time. There is a breakpoint between those, and we're about to do the theory behind where that breakpoint is. The short answer is, from a modern statistical point of view, there is no breakpoint. What you should do is report what you have and let the, let the user make the conclusion. In classical null hypothesis significance testing, um, there's a common value that's used, which is 0 0.05. If your probability, if your proportion of cases that are out there is larger than 0 0.05, you don't reject the null, and if it's smaller than 0.05, you do reject the null. 
that's sort of an antiquated way of thinking, and it's, it's changing literally as we speak, like in these past couple of years and moving forward people in the statistical community are grappling with how do we change the way people think about this because the problem is science is getting harder and 0.05 isn't small enough and really this whole method has flaws that people overlook. So let's talk about that via the theory. Hypothesis testing. So in the last two cases we utilized hypothesis tests and last day we talked about how this is similar to a criminal trial with a judge and a jury and you make a decision on the basis of your evidence. So in these cases, we have two competing possibilities. A null hypothesis, which represents skepticism and no difference, there's nothing to see here, move along. You know, there is no impact of the thing you're talking about. And an alternative hypothesis that says, no, there's something going on. There is a possibility of a change. There is a treatment effect where your intervention has done something. Those are always the two cases. It's always a binary decision. Now, the alternative does not have to be a single quantity. That's what we've done so far, as we've said sort of the alternative is that it's this. Typically, when we do an alternative hypothesis, it will be a range of quantities. And so what we'll get is things like uh, greater than or equal to 0 0.200 or less than 0 0.1 and things like that. We'll get alternatives that just say, I don't know what it is, but I think it's over there. And that's, that's usually how you phrase your, your alternative hypothesis. No hypotheses are usually single quantities or numbers and they're just set up that way to make them simple hypotheses so that they're actually amenable to the, the classical sort of theory. There are ways around that but it's not worth worrying about. Most of the cases you'll see will be just set up to be a number. And usually for the first few examples we do it's zero. You assume there's nothing going on. P is zero and then your alternative is no P is big, P is negative, something. So let's talk about something called the p-value. So in both of these cases we've examined, the gender bias study and in the DVD study, we concluded with a number out of 100, number out of 1,000 representation where we said, look, we ran a bunch of simulations and we would see a result like the one that we saw in the actual study by chance this amount of time. Two in 100, seven in 1,000. That quantity that represents how many times we would see a result like that by chance under the assumption of the null hypothesis is called a p-value. And it is the probability of observing data at least as favorable to the alternative as the current data set under the assumption of the null. And that's why we don't just look for cases that are identical to the thing that we observe in the experiment. We look at where the experiment line is on the distribution, on the dot plot or the histogram, and then we move out toward the edge, out to the tail of the distribution. And that quantity is what's called the p-value. Um, we will typically use a summary statistic. In the cases we've seen so far, it's been difference in proportions. So we've had proportion for treatment and proportion for control, and we take the difference between them, and then that is our statistic that represents our experiment. We will, across the next, whatever we have left, eight weeks, seven weeks, plus all of next semester, develop increasingly sophisticated ways to do this same problem over and over and over again until you start to hate it but that's how statistics goes. It's all the same problem. The majority of this course is null hypothesis significance testing. It's just different context, different data, different model, but it's all the same procedure over and over and over again. And typically in a course like this, uh, you wouldn't introduce this null hypothesis idea until about week 14, by which point it's so late that you've kind of already done a whole bunch of stuff and you don't know how to put it together. This version of the course, the rebuild of the curriculum that we've done and this textbook introduces it really early. You know, week three, you are introduced to the idea, and then we're just going to use it over and over and over and over again until the end of the year, by which point it will be drilled into your brains, and you won't forget it, which is sort of the goal. I mean, you're taking this course because your programs think it's useful for you. Not because you want to be here necessarily, I don't think there's very many of those, but because your program said, take a math credit, this one's a good math credit, off you go. So, When this p-value is smaller than a preset threshold, which we call alpha. So anytime you see alpha used in this course, it always represents the preset threshold for hypothesis testing. We don't use it for anything else. It's the only thing alpha is used for. Alpha is the Greek letter for A. Hopefully everybody knows that. Um, we say in that case, 
that the results are statistically significant. Now, that does not mean that you get to say that they are practically significant. And there's a very big difference between that. We talked about it a little bit last week, and we're going to keep talking about it. Just because you get a statistically significant result does not mean you get to generalize to the world and make some groundbreaking thing which leads to a Nobel Prize. It may mean that what you've said is that, yes, these 48 men were showing gender discrimination. Not going to win you big prizes in science for having said that about 48 middle-aged white men who manage banks. You know, it's kind of expected. This is known as a significance level, this alpha that you're choosing. And when the results are statistically significant, we say that the data provide strong evidence against. That's, that's the wording we use. So when we're out on that tail, when we're larger than the cutoff that we had from our experiment, we get a p-value. And that p-value, when it is smaller than the alpha you've chosen, we say that we have strong evidence against the null hypothesis. We reject the null hypothesis. And we conclude that there is a statistically significant event happening. A common value of alpha is 0.05. This is what I was sort of mentioning a minute ago. Uh, 0.05 doesn't work terribly well anymore because our data is too messy and we have effect size problems and type M errors and all kinds of things that are going on. And so really in the community, what we're trying to do is educate people away from using this method as the sole framework for thinking about statistics. And so I do want to emphasize now, just because you get a statistically significant result does not mean you have discovered the holy grail. You have not solved science. You may not have even answered the question you asked. It's just another piece of data that you put together in writing up an explanation. So do not take it as some kind of message delivered from on high on stone tablets that clearly the result that you're looking for is true. It's just a piece of evidence. Not even necessarily a terribly good one. So it's a method and you need to know about it and it's it is ubiquitous in the scientific literature. If you read scientific papers in any field, everything's always about the p-value and about whether or not you have a statistically significant result. But it doesn't mean you trust the results wholeheartedly. It just means, OK, you had an extreme result. I can take that into consideration when forming my interpretations. So, so far, gender study, we had a p-value of 0.02, 2 in 100. And the DVD study, we had a p-value of 0.007. These symbols here mean approximately equal to. I'm not saying the p-values are exactly that because they didn't really run enough simulations to get the, the precision down to a few more decimals. Um, but that, they're about that. 2 in 100, 7 in 1,000. When you run them during your workshop, take a note of what you get and how close it is. And it'll be similar but not identical to these things. So we will discuss some alternative approaches to computing these p-values after the midterm break. So there are other ways of going about doing this, and we will talk about other ways of doing that. Although, actually, we're going to start next week with, with the build-up toward that. All right, sort of a new topic, transitioning. We now have a null hypothesis significance test framework, and we have the consideration of this thing as a trial. You all know that it is possible to have a trial which ends errantly. You can have a trial where you know the defendant is guilty of sin and somehow they get off on a technicality. And you can have a trial where an innocent man or woman is sent to prison for a crime they didn't commit. We know that exists. And there are lifetime movies about these things. And you know it happens all the time and people are exonerated from DNA evidence 30 years after the fact and they emerge from prison, you know, a shell of their former human being and are given a, a buyout to go away and not bother people. But you know, it happens. The criminal justice system is not flawless. Similarly, our statistical testing framework is most decidedly not flawless. We can make mistakes. So remember this, cases are not decided on the basis of perfect evidence. We don't know everything when we go to trial. And in fact, the defense uh, attorney's job is to make sure we don't learn everything about the trial because we have biases and you need to present the evidence in a way that sways hearts and minds. In a statistical trial, we don't know everything. We don't know, in the case of gender discrimination, everything about those 48 bank managers. We don't know their history. We don't know how old they are. We don't know. We don't even, all we know is their gender. We don't know how old they are. We don't know their race. We don't know their experience. We just know they're male and a bank manager. 
So there's lots of things there that could be influencing things. We don't have perfect information. We decide on the basis of reasonable doubt. Do you believe that this defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Or in the case of a statistical trial, do we believe that the result we obtained is extreme enough that it would not happen very often just by chance? It's a rare event. That's our reasonable doubt. But we can make mistakes. We can just have an extreme result just by chance, and that's just how it goes. So what are the errors? There are two competing statements, which means there's four ways to screw it up. Number one, or four ways to make a decision, two ways to screw it up, two ways to have a right result. If the null hypothesis is true, and there's nothing going on, and it's all just random, and we fail to reject that null hypothesis, that is a good thing. We have made the right decision. If the null hypothesis is true, and we make the decision to reject it anyway because we got just a randomly extreme result, that is bad. If the alternative is true, there is really something going on, but we didn't have enough evidence to see that. It ended up being in the center of the distribution, and we failed to reject the null. That's bad. We didn't make the right decision. And then finally, the alternative can be true, and we decide for the alternative, and that's good. So overall, there are two good cases and two bad cases from our decision process. These have names. And these names are the bane of most first year stat students trying to keep them straight in their head. A type one error is what happens when your null hypothesis is true, but you reject it anyway. It's called type one. Sometimes uh, in older textbooks, it's called type one with a Roman numeral just to make things that much more annoying. And the other one is type two with a Roman numeral. We will just say one and two in our regular Arabic numerals. This is a null true reject anyway case for a type one error. It's also called a false positive. And you have to try and keep that straight in your head, and that's one of the hardest things, is to try and figure out how to remember which one is which. The type 2 error is where the alternative is actually true, but we just don't decide for it. We're like, nope, we fail to reject that null hypothesis. This is known as a false negative. So the wording there, false positive, false negative, the positives and the negatives, refers to the action of deciding for the alternative. You're deciding on the case of there is something going on. So if you falsely say a positive result, you're falsely saying there's something going on, which means you're falsely deciding for the alternative against the null. If you have a false negative result, you're saying negative, there's nothing going on, even though there really is, and it's false, and that's the case of the type two. That's sometimes enough to help you, but here's a little thing to help. This is how I first remembered, and I dug this picture out from 15 years ago, uh, got it straight in my head. So instead of thinking it as a criminal trial or as an all hypothesis, think of it as a pregnancy diagnosis. So we have this nice man. He's sitting there. The doctor's listening to his heart. And the doctor's like, I have bad news for you. This is a 50-something male. You're pregnant. And he goes, uh, what now? You know, this is not twins, it's not a movie from the 90s. Whereas we have this woman, and you can see the age of this, like she looks like she's wearing like a jean shirt or something. So I don't know, like very clearly about seven to nine months pregnant. She's in her third trimester. You know, the baby is coming along very shortly now. Bad news for you, you're not pregnant. And she's, bleh, 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 what's going on? So what do we have here? We have a false positive diagnosis. And that's the way to keep track of it is that a type one error is a positive diagnosis when it's not true. We have this man being told, you're pregnant. And he's like, I'm male, that can't happen. And then we have this woman who's very clearly pregnant and has been suffering through her pregnancy and is not in the mood for some doctor to be like, you're not pregnant. She's like, I'm very much pregnant. Thank you very much. I didn't sleep last night. So a false positive diagnosis is a false diagnosis of being pregnant, positive. And a false negative is falsely saying you're not when clearly you are. So if that helps, great. It helped me when I first was starting learning this stuff many years ago now. And so this is just a way to keep 
really what it's trying to do is keep the positive and negative straight in your head and how that works. So here's practice for you. In a court case, we consider the defendant to be either innocent, that's the default null case, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty, so that's the null hypothesis, or guilty, the alternative hypothesis. What would a type 1 error be in a court case? Type 1 error is a false positive, which represents choosing which side. So she's saying, number four, to exonerate a guilty person. So the person's guilty, so the truth is the alternative, but you're exonerating them, which is deciding on the null. So you've got it backwards. Yeah. So it is number two. It is convicting a guilty person. It's a type one error. It's deciding to go with the alternative even though the null is true. The null is innocent. So Innocent is true, so they're actually innocent, so that tracks it down. We've got one or three, but then it's an error, so we're doing the wrong thing to an innocent person. Question? No? Okay. That's good. So, we convict an innocent person even when we shouldn't have. So the null is true. That's what happens in a type 1 error. The null is true. They're truly innocent and we make the wrong decision, which is the not innocent decision, which is conviction. So this is a type one error. So you have an innocent person and they are convicted. You believe that you have evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, but you didn't, really. You made the wrong decision. So your answer is also an error, right? If we exonerate a guilty person, that's also a problem. What kind of error is that? That's the other one. That's the type two, where the truth is that they are guilty, which means the alternative is the truth, but we exonerate them, which means we're deciding for the innocent case, which is the null, so we are making a false negative diagnosis. We are telling a pregnant woman she is not pregnant. All right, so general philosophical case, actually, and if you take any courses in justice studies, this actually comes up, although without the statistical language. What if we wanted to lower the type one error? What would that entail? So type one error is where you convict an innocent person. What if we wanted to make sure that that never happened? What if we believed that was what we needed to do as a society? Well, don't, don't, don't frame it in the statistical sense. That, that is something like you can, you can change alpha, you're right. But, but generally, as a justice question in a, clinic, in a criminal trial, what would you have to do to lower that type one error? Not really. I mean, that, that's, that's a biased question. So she said, make sure everyone has a fair trial. And that definitely is a problem. You know, you have, you have cases where people are not defended well. You have cases where there's clear bias on the part of the prosecution and so on. So how? How would you do that? You're right. So she's saying not convict. And that, that's, that's actually one way you can do it, yeah. So she says, uh, change it from beyond a reasonable doubt to just some doubt. So would that actually lead us to a smaller type 1 error rate? If, if now, instead of beyond a reasonable doubt, all I just say is, you look guilty, prison for you. You look guilty too, prison for you. You, know, like you, have, to, you have to increase the demands on the court system if you want to send less innocent people to prison. There's studies showing both ways, actually. That one's interesting. So his, his suggestion is get rid of jury trials entirely. Just let educated judges who are elected or like placed on the bench by the government make the decision for us and trust their opinion. And there's studies showing that actually sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. There's a particular case study which was done on um, parole board hearings. So you have three judges sitting in a parole board hearing for prisoners. There is a segment of time in the two hours before lunch when the chances of you getting parole go way, way down because they're hungry and they're irritable and they're just like, no. So you get a judge in a bad mood, you go to prison even though you're innocent. So 
that can be bad and that can also be good. You know, jury trials are weird, but what they're supposed to do is wisdom of the crowd kind of argument. If you have 12 people that you have to sway, and all you need is one on your side to break the jury, right? You have to convince 12 of them of the guilt instead of just one man or woman on the bench. So, so these ideas are kind of getting at the right idea, though. If you want to lower the type 1 error rate, it means you want to lower the number of people sent to prison who didn't actually commit the crime. To do that, you have to demand even more evidence. You have to say, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, they need to be caught red-handed. You need to have video evidence of that person where you can clearly make out their face, performing the crime, and a confession, or no prison for you. If you want to drive down the type 1 error rate, you've got to make it harder to send people to prison. And so, so lower the conviction rate, but lower the number of cases decided for the prosecution. That's how you lower the type 1 error rate. Question? Um, it's not a question, but I would say, like, eyewitness testimonies are not really reliable. And in those cases, that would also... That's starting to become a thing in Canadian courts, American courts as well, is that eyewitness testimony, which used to be considered the gold standard of conviction, has actually been proven to be entirely flawed and people are really bad at remembering things and can be led and coached and things like that and so they're actually just starting to go you know eyewitness testimony is not valid even when it's a police officer on the stand they are just as prone to this bias as anybody else eyewitness testimony means very little video evidence on the other hand is much harder to fake and so that's that's where courts are kind of getting in there Yes, so the question is, what happens to the other error when you do this? They're not exactly additively inverse, but yes, if I increased, or rather wanted to decrease the type 1 error rate, I want to reduce the number of innocent people going to prison, what's that going to do to my type 2 error rate, which is the case of guilty people going free? If I now demand evidence that is way beyond a reasonable doubt, there's going to be lots of people who skate through in the middle there who actually committed the crime, but they get away with it, because as a society, we have decided it's better to send one innocent, or like avoid sending one innocent person to prison than have 10 guilty people be convicted. And that's the trade off, right? You don't get one without the other. And so the question would then be how do you lower the type 2 error rate? In other words, let's make sure no one ever escapes a crime. What do you do? Well, then we get back to your suggestion, and we just say throw them all in prison, make the evidence marginal. Oh, you were in the same city on the same day? Prison for you. You, know, you, can, you can scale it up and you can make your type 2 error rate essentially zero. If you enter the court system, you go to prison. Not fair, but you can do it, right? And everything is a trade-off. There's no such thing as a free lunch. There's always a trade-off between the two sides. So her question is, is sort of smart criminals pinning it on somebody else. Yeah, there's always these things. We have to assume that we're in a microcosm here. We have one person under trial. The question is, we know that there is a truth that they are innocent or guilty, and they have a trial, and we make a decision. And within that context, how do we fix our decision-making process? So as you see, look, there's no way to fix both of them simultaneously. You can either err more strongly on the side that innocent people should never go to prison, even if it means guilty people go free, because that as a society is our priority, or we can err on the other side and we say, you know what, we want to catch all the criminals, send all of them, even if it means we scoop up a few innocent people in the net. And so there's a trade-off in there, and there's no easy answer. At the back, yeah. So the question is, if you add more evidence or, or add the requirement for more evidence, will it not improve both? The problem is, within the context of a single trial, which is all we're asking about, demanding more evidence is going to protect people from being sent to prison on tenuous evidence, but it's going to also protect criminals for whom there's only tenuous evidence against. So using your example of cameras on police cars, which in Canada we already have them on the cars themselves, not on the officers yet, um, if you demand footage, 
then a criminal who's smart enough to strafe to the side and stay out of the line of sight of the camera you know, can still go free, right? And so you don't get one without the other. Anytime you try and reduce one, you get an increase in the other automatically because you're trading off between them. And it's just a question of where your priorities lie. And so in a lot of clinical trials, um, they, they will err on one side or the other. And the, the common thing is to man a type 2 error rate that's no more than 0.2. Okay, let's continue. Choosing significance levels. So this is what I was mentioning earlier about the whole thing that you get to choose alpha and the community is sort of commonly said a traditional value is 0.05. This comes from a very old paper from the 30s. It's been used ever since. And the idea is that it's one in 20 chance or 5% chance. And that's kind of was considered to be a nice trade-off between the type one and the type two errors. You say, okay, 5% of the time I'm going to make the wrong call, but I'm not increasing my type two error rate too much. So that's kind of a nice trade off there in the middle. And it, it actually, it's hard though, because type two error rate is very tricky to compute. So we can err on one side or the other in a case where there's a strong piece of evidence showing that one of these things is more important than the other. For example, in the court system, we err on the side of lowering type one. We, we traditionally have said it's better to let innocent people not go to prison to protect them than to worry about catching every last criminal and sending every last criminal to prison. That's the side we err on. What about medical diagnoses? So let's, let's move away from the court system now and let's ask about medical diagnoses. So you go in, you get a blood test and the doctor comes back and says, you have tuberculosis. Do we want to err more on the side of type one error to try and lower the type 1 error, which means never telling someone they have a diagnosis when they don't. So I walk up to you and I say, you have TB, and you say, OK. And you didn't actually, it was just a false positive in the testing result. Or do I want to err on the other side and say, I want everybody who has the slightest chance of having this thing to know about it, even if it means I obviously tell a bunch of people the wrong information. And again, like this is this is tricksy, right? Like, well, what happens to you if you go in to see your doctor? You have a routine checkup, and they say you have cancer, and your brain immediately starts going into overdrive, and you're like, I'm young. How is this happening to me? You know, do I need to? Like, how bad is it? Like, like what's going on? And it was all just a false diagnosis, right? There is a there is a mental harm that comes with being told incorrect information that you need to worry about. Question. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's, 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 that's a very fair point, which is just that if you proceed full-fledged to the medical treatment side of things and you don't actually have it, um, a lot of stuff we use to treat us for, for diseases is not terribly good for you. Like in 30 years, we are going to look back on what we've been doing with cancer and go, this was the dark ages. We essentially kill you in the hopes that we kill your cancer slightly faster than you so we get the cancer dead and then we back off quick before you actually die. That's what chemotherapy is. You're trying to kill the cancer faster than the person. But you know what's killing the person. That's barbaric. And it's the best option we have. In 30 years, we're going to look back on that and say it's silly. So it also really depends on what, what it is. Severity of disease, right? If I tell you you have glaucoma, and we catch it a couple weeks later because you go to an optometrist, he's like, no, your doctor's on crack. You don't have glaucoma. What's he saying? Not a big deal. But something where it's like, this is really bad and we need to immediately get you on doses of X, Y, Z. Otherwise, you're going to die in 24 hours. You really want to know they have it. So this, this comes into, yes, backup tests. What can we do? Well, first off, which is better, lower type 1 or lower type 2? What do you think? I think that you're right. It matters which disease it is. If it's something that's not absolutely critical, it's not going to kill you in the next 10 minutes, Run a second test. You know, if you think you have TB and it's not that big of a deal because, you know, you're just a passive carrier, whatever, do another blood test, send it off to a different lab and make sure you get two independent diagnoses, which lowers your type 1 without affecting your type 2 because you did two tests. If you think you have cancer, let's do a biopsy. That's what biopsies are for, is they tell you whether it's a malignant tumor or not, and they tell you what kind of tumor and how aggressive it is and all these kinds of things. If they think you have HIV, run a second blood test. It's not going to kill you in the next 10 minutes. We've got time. And so this is where the trade-off comes. And so if you have something that's absolutely time sensitive, 
you need to know right now or this person may die. Then obviously you want to err more on the side of making sure you always make the right call, even if that means you kind of miss things. And so depending on the severity of what you're trying to do and depending on what the treatment path is, you err more on one side or the other. There's no hard and fast answer. But it's interesting, right? You know, you may not have thought about this, but when they do blood tests, they often do two of them. Because that way, they have the chance to check to make sure there was no contamination in the vial, no contamination from the person who took your blood, no contamination from the lab where they did the testing, no false positives just because of antibodies. For example, for TB, um, you can be tested for TB, and then it can come back positive, and you don't have TB, you were immunized for TB as a child. But if, they, if you tell them that you weren't immunized and they get the thing, they think that you have it. And they need to know that, in fact, your body has the antibodies because you were immunized when you were an infant. And those things come into play, right? So there's no good answer. Welcome to real life. Everything is messy and everything has trade-offs. Okay, two-sided hypotheses. Let's move on to sort of a new way of thinking about things. Sorry, did you have a question? Both. <laughs> Basically, the, the, the question is which one's better. It depends on the disease. It depends on the context. It depends on the severity of the symptoms. If you really need to know, like for example, you come into the hospital, you're coughing, you have what appears to be bad flu symptoms. They say, have you been near animals lately? You say yes, boom, quarantine. It may just be the flu. It might be H1N3, H1N5, H1N7. It may be the bird flu or the swine flu or all these different flus. It may be massively contagious and the start of an epidemic. Into quarantine you go. Because quarantine isn't going to hurt you. It just isolates you in case it really is nasty. But if the treatment involves immediately pumping you through full of drugs that could actually damage your kidney and your livers, they really want to know that they've got the right call first. And so it depends which, which sort of thing it is, which side you're going to err on the side of. That, that's what I wanted you to see is that it's a messy problem with no right answer. All right, two-sided. In both of these hypotheses, we actually ignored alternatives. We decided on one side. Our assumption in the gender bias case was that the men were biased against the women. The male bank managers were biased against the female candidates. We did not consider the opposite. We did not say, what if the men are biased against the men? Why did we do that? <laughs> Social cues. But... From a statistical point of view, there's nothing stopping that from being the case. And so in default, we just performed one-sided hypothesis tests because we thought we knew the direction. That's because we had prior information that we used to inform our decisions about how we set up our studies. But there's a big danger there. When you think you know what's going on and you set up a one-sided hypothesis test, you may actually be wrong. And this comes up a lot in studies where there's really no good information about what's going on, in particular psychology and sociology studies that are studies about people where we really don't know how we work. And you're doing a study about how people respond in subconscious ways to things. We don't have good priors. We don't know for a fact that it's one direction or the other. And so by default, if you don't have a strong piece of prior evidence giving you information saying that it should be one direction, we default to the alternative being two-tailed, where we say the null hypothesis is that there's nothing going on. The alternative hypothesis is that there is something going on and we don't know what it is. It could be a positive effect or it could be a negative effect. It could be on either tail of the distribution. That's the default case that you should take, is that you don't know what's going on and that the two-tailed is better. If you only use an alternative that conforms with what you think is going on, that's actually known as confirmation bias. You're reinforcing your own assumptions. You know, in the case of the gender bias, we are reinforcing our assumptions that middle-aged male bank managers are going to discriminate against women because there's 48 of them and they're all bank managers. There's no female bank managers there to kind of balance things out and go female bank managers are competent. And so they just instinctively, subconsciously go, maybe this person needs to be better than I think the average is for me to promote. And that's discrimination and it's illegal, but it's subconscious. It's not as if 
many of those bank managers actually made a conscious decision to, to slam the women. It just happened. And that's the problem with these biases in society, is that they're almost never overt. You know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of casual racism in our societies. And it's, you know, there's overt racism too, and everybody's like, overt racists are bad. You know, punch a racist today. But casual racism and, and subconscious racism is there too, and affects you every day, and people don't know they're doing it. And in fact, react really strongly when you call them on it. Because what you're doing is you're saying, you're racist. And that's like horrible. And you're like, no, no, I'm not racist. And they're like, but look at this thing that you just did. And you're like, oh, I am racist. That's the, but it's hard to look at your own problems. And so in general, with confirmation bias, you have to be very careful to protect your science from your person. Because it's very easy for your opinions and your feelings to bias your results. Question? No. So no, the, the come together thing is, is not, that's just a, fa that's a factor of modern science. The idea that you need big teams to do stuff, it's just that the problems we're dealing with are hard. What is good that you use to try and protect your studies from this is double blinding your studies. And that you've seen in the previous lectures. If you don't know what thing you're giving to the patient, then you're not going to bias it because you don't know and you don't care. Even better, use a third party to implement your treatment, who has no dog in the fight, who doesn't care what's going to happen. That way, your opinions of what should happen and what you want to happen and the confirmation of your research hypothesis, which wins you more funding and accolades and so on, doesn't influence the actual study. But unfortunately, that's really hard. It costs money, and we don't have all that much money in science. So, All right, another example for you. You've all seen the scenes on TV show. Burst through the crowd. I know CPR. And off you go. and. Yeah, that's basically bullshit, like, like almost 100% bullshit. Um, if you do CPR right, you dramatically injure that person. For anybody who's formally trained in CPR, you will have been told this by your instructor. But if you perform CPR right, you better crack some ribs, or you're doing shit all. So here's the case. It's used on a case where someone has had a heart attack, their heart is no longer pumping, but they are alive. And the goal is to circulate blood through the system, at least in a small amount of way, while repopulating the oxygen molecules in the lungs through the breathing apparatus, or just breathing, to keep them alive just long enough to get them on a respirator and hopefully get their heart working. It's a last ditch effort. It almost never works. And TV is really bad because it makes it seem like it'll save anyone. You know, no, it won't. So the problem is you can crack ribs, you can damage internal organs, it can trigger blood clots, it essentially can kill the person you're trying to save. And in fact, done right, it should, because the whole goal is to get things moving in an area protected by a rib cage where, where you know, nature's like, yeah, no, you don't want to touch the heart, that's bad, that will kill us. You're like, no, no, I really, really, really want to, right now, crack, crack, crack. So here's a study to see whether this actually is sort of making a difference. We have patients who underwent CPR in the field for a heart attack or in the hospital for a heart attack were subsequently admitted to a hospital where they were randomly assigned to either receive a blood thinner to try and counteract blood clots that came as a result of the internal injuries that were caused by the CPR or were just not given a blood thinner and allowed to just rest in the, in the bed. The thing is, there wasn't actually any strong evidence either way that the blood thinner was helping. There's a lot if, if you ever get a, like a eMERGE doc drunk and just start talking to them about things, there is a tremendous amount about our emergency healthcare system that is done because it seems to work. Not because there's evidence either way, not because formal studies have been done, because it seems to work and why not? It can't harm, or you know, we don't have any evidence that it harms. Medicine is still very much in a transition from the dark ages of leeches and bleeding to a modern scientific discipline, and a lot of our modern stuff is very much old wives' tales and things that kind of maybe work, but we don't really know why. Majorly because how do you do a clinical trial on people? The ethics board doesn't like it when you just randomly say, you get treatment for your heart attack and you don't. So this was a case they somehow got past IRB and I have no idea how, but they were able to split it into these people get blood thinners, these people don't, because there wasn't actually any strong evidence that said that blood thinners did help. It was just, everybody did it because they knew that there were blood clots and lots of people die from blood clots after CPR. So they split them 50-50. The outcome is, did you survive for 24 hours? Welcome to medical studies. 
The outcome is usually a survival variable, which is that you survive for a length of time. This one's particularly short. Most cancer trials and most cancer drugs and all these sorts of things, five years. That's what they report. So if you have a family member or you know someone who suffered from cancer and they underwent chemotherapy, all of the trials that have been run, which determined what type of drugs they were given and what type of treatments they were given, are done on the basis of trying to maximize the five-year survival rate, which is they need to live for five years. That's all they're trying to buy you. They can't guarantee you're going to live for 30 because they don't even know how old you are. Five-year survival rate. Here, we're looking at 24 hours. You've been in the hospital for 24 hours after a heart attack. You're still alive. We want to understand whether these blood thinners actually help or not. So, the hypothesis, nothing going on. Blood thinners are useless. They don't affect things either way. They do nothing to impact the survival rates. The alternative hypothesis is that they do have an impact, but we need to allow, be very careful, for the negative. What is the other thing that blood thinners can cause? They're blood thinners. More damage to your body because if you take a blood thinner, it thins your blood, it prevents clots, it also makes you more prone to bleeding out. And you already have internal injuries because somebody cracked your chest in the process of doing CPR. You may have organ failure, organ damage. So blood thinners could actually accelerate the death. We don't know which way it is, and we're not allowed to have a side in this fight. So our null hypothesis is that it is, the difference is zero. There is no impact. The alternative is that the difference is not equal to zero. It could be positive, it could have an effect and actually promote life, or it could have a negative effect and it could actually cause death. We do not know. There are 50 patients in the experiment who did not receive a blood thinner and 40 patients who did. So this was a 90-patient study at a large hospital. Uh, if anybody does want to read the original paper, I can dig it out. I've got it somewhere. Of these 50 patients in the control group who received no blood thinners, 11 out of 50 lived. Yeah, CPR doesn't save you. You know, If you have a heart attack, and it's a major heart attack, and your heart actually stops beating, you're not doing well. You know, this is, TV has masked this from us and made us think that, you know, you can have a heart attack, some person bursts through the crowd, does emergency CPR and some sort of like, surgery right there on the floor because it's Grey's Anatomy, because of course they do, using some sort of knife and a pencil. And then you go to a hospital and a week later you're back playing golf. Heart attacks are serious business. People die all the time to serious heart attacks. We have come a long way at reducing deaths to heart attacks, not because our techniques for dealing with heart attacks are better, but because our drugs for cholesterol control are better. We treat the symptoms that lead to the heart attack, not the heart attack itself. Heart attacks, once they happen, you're in trouble. Question. So if someone has a heart attack, is it better for you to just sit there and call 911? There are, <laughs> yeah. If you have no formal training, don't pretend you do. If you have CPR training, make sure you remember what the cases are where it actually helps. And if they're having a heart attack, but they're still functional and conscious, what are you doing? Just help them, rest position, call 911, and let the pros deal with it. If, however, they have passed out and their heart is no longer beating and they don't have a pulse, that is the one time when you can kick in and try and do it, if you know what you're doing. But if, you're, if your best knowledge of CPR is that you need a song to sing along to and that you somehow thump somewhere around the solar plexus, please don't. You're just going to hurt the person. In the treatment group, which is the people who got the blood thinners, 14 out of 40 survived. So there is a difference. It is pretty slight. 65 of these 90 heart attacks died within 24 hours. Human mortality is a thing. We die to stuff all the time. We're kind of protected from that because we've come so far at eliminating the easy stuff. The hard stuff's still hard. So the question is, how can we rely on these, these studies, statistics in general, if you know, there's so much else that's going on? And I'll flip that around to you. How can we rely on science? 
Science is a messy discipline. You are coming here from high school where you were taught all of the established science, the stuff that nobody questions anymore, although biology has some stuff still. You know, there's always people like, no, evolution's false. It's like, eh, okay. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's the stuff we know. You learned about, if you took high school chemistry, you learned about the stuff we really understand. In high school physics, you learned about momentum and, you know, speed and things that are very much physical constraints. They exist. Welcome to university. From here on, we are going to get vaguer and vaguer. And if you go to grad school, it's going to get even more vague because at the end of the day, we don't know everything yet. And that's what science is about, is trying to discover the answers to things we don't know. This is just the best framework we've found so far for working within the uncertainty of the problem. And you're absolutely right. At the end of this, this proves nothing, right? It just gives you more evidence for a very select group of people in a very select group sort of setup without any consideration of their genetic background, the severity of their heart attack, the type of blockage that occurred, you name it. We don't know. And so it's just a small piece of evidence in the pile of evidence. And once you have enough evidence in that pile, it kind of goes, undergoes sedimentary rock deposits and you get nice little blocks of known science. Medicine is not there yet. Biology is not there yet. Ecology is very much not there yet because we just don't have enough data. Physics is way down the road. Because in physics, there's a lot of stuff we could do. There's no IRB saying you're not allowed to do an experiment with some balls. You can do whatever you want. And so in physics, we are plumbing the depths of the known universe. We're looking at subatomic things. We're trying to figure out how fundamental fields work. We're well beyond the everyday stuff. Unfortunately, there's whole areas of science, and the majority of you are in fields of the science where we genuinely do not know the answers yet. So welcome to university and welcome to uncertainty. It only gets worse from here. <laughs> So back to that chart, two lectures ago, final slide, when can we generalize this? We would need to be able to generalize by knowing randomly selected heart attack patients who had CPR done on them. That's, that's the population. We have a convenient sample of 90 heart attack patients who had CPR done on them from a single hospital in a single city somewhere in the world. To really generalize this, we would need to have this as an institutional control across, say, the entire United States, every hospital in the US. And somebody comes in and they flip a coin. And 50-50, they're given blood thinner or not. And those are randomly selected heart attack patients across a period of time. Then we could generalize to the population, which is people who had heart attacks who underwent CDPR. That's as far as it goes, because that's all we're concerned with. So this is hard. It's genuinely hard. Don't let the fact that these are solved problems make you think that this entire field is easy. These are genuinely difficult problems, and the act of science is genuinely difficult. And you need to, that's why you're here, is to learn enough to hopefully be practicing, you know, junior scientists. Here's our data. What are PC and PT? So PC is 11 divided by 50, because that's going back. Just highlight these, 11 divided by 50 and 14 divided by 40. So 11 divided by 50 is 0 0.220. And 14 divided by 40, what's that? It's not 0.25, it's a little bit lower. And the point estimate of the difference in survival proportions, which is essentially every problem we've done so far. I think I did that right. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah. I'm doing it in my head, okay. <laughs> sorry, what did you get? <laughs> Three, five? Yes, thank you. I was off by a lot. <laughs> And then treatment is 0 0.35 to minus 0 0.220, which is 0 0.13. So not quite as big as our previous results have been, but you know, it's an IRB study. We only had 90 patients, and the difference doesn't seem to be very high. So how do we now compute a p-value? We need to do a simulation. We can simulate this. Population is the overall set of 90 people, 25 survivals. 
65 deaths, 90 patients. Once you have those 90 patients, you randomly go, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 39, 40, you are the treatment group. 1, 2, 3, 4, 49, 50, you are the control group. And then once you have those, you compute PT minus PC. So it's a similar thing to the last one we ran with the DVD and the, the economics study, except that we have a group of 40 and a group of 50 out of 90 instead of a group of 75 and 75 out of 150. Same simulation. Question? <coughs> So the question was, how many go into each? Well, we know these from the study design. It was in the original statement. All right, here's some R code. I'm actually going to show you this R code. So when you get to this on the workshop, you can actually just go grab this R code if you want. So we start by creating the patient pool, the big old sack the stuff gets pulled out of. We have 11 living patients from the first group of 50 and 39 dead and 14 living and 26 dead. So we do ones as a survival and zeros as a death. It's going to make things a little bit easier when we use these numbers. So if you see a one, that means a patient who lived. And if you see a zero, that means a patient who died. Now we sample from that big bag of patients 40 times. Question. So in this case, Replace is false, which is the default, because once I've pulled a patient out of the sack, I don't put them back in and let them be drawn out again. No, it, it defaults to that. You only change it if it's true. So, so yeah, it's, it's a good point. If you ran the code so that it said replace is false, it would be absolutely identical because it defaults to that case. But you can do it just to be 100% sure to yourself. So we pull 40 out without replacement. We now have 40 in a pile, 50 in the sack. Those 40 are our treatment group. The sack is our control group. And so what we do is we take the sum of the 40 from the treatment group. And the sum goes through and says, all right, 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1, plus 1, plus 0, plus 0. And it goes through the 40 of them, and it adds them all up. And what will be the net result there? Exactly. It's the number of ones. And that's why I use the ones and zeros, is it lets me cheat and treat it as a math problem. I've got 40 numbers in a string. 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. If I add them all up, I get how many ones there were, because the zeros contribute nothing. And so the net result is how many patients survived the ones from my treatment group. I divide that by 40. That is my P sub T. I then take, and again, I cheat. This is the process of elimination again. I take the 25 total patients that I knew were in the sack at the start of the draw, and I subtracted what I just had in my pile of treatment, which is what's left over in the sack. That number is then divided by 50 to give me my PC. And I take PT and subtract PC, and the result is that actually the blood thinner impacted in a negative fashion, very small amount, in this first simulation. Does one simulation mean anything? No, we do not generalize from this. We do not take this as meaning anything. It just means, hey, we did the experiment once. Let's do it again and again and again and again, 100,000 times. So what do I do? Just like you did in your workshop this past week, I create a vector to store my results in, and then I do a loop. And we're going to talk about loops uh, more toward the midterm break and actually show you how to create your own. But for now, you can just sort of copy paste monkey see, monkey do on the code. And for J in 1 to 100,000 samples, I take my experiment where I sample from the patients, and then I take the sum of the experiment over 40. So this is PT right here. 
minus the leftovers over 50, that's PC. Two lines of code looped over and over and over again. It takes about 0.4 of a second to run. 100,000 simulations. Here's what they look like. So you've got positives, you've got negatives, you've got numbers all over the map. This means nothing to us because we can't read it. So we plot it. And there is 100,000 simulations under the null hypothesis, which are the proportion of the simulated scenarios which fall on those numbers. And our observed difference this time of 0 0.13 is right here. This is our first case where this is not obviously out on the tail, right? There are a lot of cases by chance that are bigger and a lot of cases that are smaller. It doesn't appear to be an extreme result. Out of 100,000 simulated experiments, 13,154 of my run there, and yours will be a bit different when you do it in workshop, were at least that big or even bigger. And so, this is going to turn into our p-value. So the right tail area from our value of 0.13 all the way out to the right tail is 0 0.132. This is purely 100% a random coincidence. Those numbers are not the same in general. Don't, don't assume there's something going on there. That's just randomly, this, this particular setup and this particular experiment led to a result where... This area here was essentially the same area under the curve as the point that was the cutoff on the left-hand side. Just chance. Just random. Don't generalize from that. But our alternative hypothesis was two-tailed. We said we don't know if these blood thinners are going to be a positive therapeutic effect on the patients or a negative effect on the patients. They could, they could actually kill people. So we have to say when we set up our p-value that our actual p-value is twice the value from that out to the tail or 0 0.263. And now this is the first time since we've reviewed what an alpha is. So in a standard alpha of 0 0.05, is this number bigger than alpha? Yep. Yeah, not intended to be a hard question. It's, it's more of a rhetorical, like, are you awake question. 0.26, definitely bigger than 0 0.05, which means that in this case, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis for the first time this semester. We do not have evidence at the 0 0.05 level to conclude that the alternative hypothesis happens or to reject the null, we do not find evidence that the blood thinner had any influence whatsoever on the survival rate of these CPR heart attack patients. Which is where we're at with most things to do with emergency medicine, which is why emergency medicine is so messed up. And people live or die often just by chance and has very little to do with what we do to them. <coughs> If you compute the p-value as I've shown you, which is to say you take the area to the right here of the value you found in the one experiment you're basing your simulation on, so this purple thing, that is a one-sided p-value. If you had a two-sided alternative hypothesis, then yes, you just you double it. You take the number, multiply it by two, and you're done. So how do we use this? General, in science, and again, science is hard. This is not an easy, trivial thing. The labs you were forced to do in high school may have given you a false impression of how science works. You don't take an, a foreknown conclusion and set up a little study with a spring and a mass to study Hooke's law. Science is, we have no idea what's going on. Let's try and figure it out. This is hard. So what do we do? We frame a research question. We try and set it up in the hypothesis framework. Some problems cannot be set up this way. They're still valid science. Let me just finish the slide. Collect data. We have to collect data. You can't do statistics without data. I don't care whether it's an observational study or a true experiment, but you have to have data or you're not doing statistics. You need samples. We analyze that data. We choose an analysis technique appropriate to the data. This is our entire year. From this point on, 
what we're going to be doing is developing more and more and more methods within the same framework for analyzing different kinds of data. Because data is not all the same. So far, we've looked at stuff that's very amenable to writing it as a proportion. A lot of data is not like that. So we want to develop methods that will work on those data as well. And we form a conclusion using the p-value as a piece of evidence to allow us to make a decision. Do we side with the alternative or do we side with no? Your question. No, that's morally abhorrent. Come on. So the question is, were we better off in the days 100 years ago where when someone was a prisoner, the medical people could just experiment on them and figure out how it worked? From a purely cold and calculating point of view, having a population you can experiment on does improve the speed of science. That's why we use nice like, little light, white rats and we experiment on them. We are already having issues with whether it is permissible to scale things up to chimpanzees. Because you know, there's a question of sort of what level of intellect are they actually at, and is it appropriate for us as humans who are ethical to actually experiment on chimpanzees and other monkeys? And you know, rats we're kind of OK with, because they're not in any way like challenged as a species. If you leave two rats in a room with food, there'll be soon seven rats, whereas monkeys are actually, you know, having habitat issues. So from a purely cold point of view, some of the research that came out of World War II in the concentration camps was valuable research. It actually led us to understand things we did not previously know. The methods used were unacceptable, and they were abhorrent. And you, you don't do that. Like, that's still, like, obviously, right? You know, we're, we're all sensible human beings. No one's advocating for a Mengele, right? But from a cold point of view, that research was used. We didn't throw it out because of where it came from. It was valuable knowledge. How we got it was horrible. And so we have gone beyond that, and we don't experiment on prisoners anymore because we are hopefully traveling the path of enlightenment. That's the theory, anyway. All right, let's go through. We've got uh, about 15 minutes left. How we kind of set these things up and what the language is here. So. A parameter for a hypothesis test is the true underlying reality that we are trying to figure out. This is a one proportion simple hypothesis test, the only type we've done so far. We will estimate this using what is called a point estimate. Remember what estimate means. Anytime you see estimate, it means wild ass guess. We're guessing. We're just doing so in a mathematical framework. Right? So, so educated guessing is the best that we're doing here. And it is done using a test statistic. Remember what statistic means? It means a thing computed using your data. So we're trying to estimate the p that is truth using the p hat that we estimate from whatever data samples we have. That's, that's the context. In the example of the CPR, we were interested in the true probability of a patient's survival under the condition that they had had a heart attack, had CPR administered them, then were admitted. We were interested in the 24-hour survival rate under blood thinners. That's what we really wanted. And we were trying to estimate that using p hat, which is our estimate of how many survived from the thing. We will denote parameters typically as Roman letters, script P, script Q, script S, and so on. And we will add hats to the estimates for the same. The null is often written as P sub zero or P sub naught, not being an old English expression for zero, and naught and null are the same thing. So the null hypothesis is the P with the zero on it. Null hypothesis of the value. In the CPR study, this was the zero. We were assuming there was no effect, so we assumed a zero. You can have cases where this is not zero, but we haven't seen any yet. All right. One last study to wrap things up. This one's kind of fun. Stanford University grad student. You get paid some amazing, like paid money to do some amazing research sometimes. So she was curious. You know the game where you tap on the table and you try and tap out a tune and the person tries to, to understand what it is? So like, listen to this. Who knows what that is? Don't say, but who knows what that is? Raise your hand. Anybody? OK. Nobody knew what it was. That's fine. I might, in the other class that I'm teaching this semester, they, about half of them knew what it was. Maybe it's just the echo and the size of the room. So I tap, you listen, you tell me what it was. 
And obviously you're going for melodic line, you're not trying to tap the bass line or something. Boom, 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 boom. You know, if you were in band, you know the bass line is boring. The melody though, you know, the flutes and the clarinets and the trumpets, like that can often be the thing that we hear. So she tried to run an experiment to see if people actually could tell what you were tapping. So she recruited 120 pairs, 240 people total, and she had a survey done at the start and said, what percentage of you think you're going to be able to figure out what song this is based on someone tapping out the melody? And about 50% of the people in her initial survey said, oh, I think, yeah, I think, I think that 50% you know, I can do it. And so she said, okay, maybe 50% of people think they can do it. Maybe 50% of people can. That was her null hypothesis. So she assumed we were starting with a P of 0.5. So we established two hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that P naught is 0 0.50. Half of the tapper listener pairs will tell the right answer. The alternative was that they are incorrect and it's in one direction. And she had no prior knowledge. She's not like, I don't assume people are like amazing tapper listeners. And I don't assume people are horrible tapper listeners. Alternative. Just alternative two-sided. It's one of the two, but it's not 0.5. Not a 50-50. Because remember, you know, 50-50 is almost like guessing. Like a 50-50 chance. I mean, when you're doing songs, there are millions of songs, and I could have tapped out anything obscure, right? So what I tapped out is actually a very well-known ditty that everybody will know if I hummed it, but the tapping didn't work. So. In her study, three out of 120 pairs successfully figured out what the tune was. That's not 50%. So from the point of view of the skeptical null hypothesis, how likely was this to have happened purely by chance? That is, actually, the null hypothesis was set up and there really is a 50-50 chance, yet of the 50-50 chance, only three pairs successfully did it. How likely is that to have happened? You already have a good intuition that this is not very likely at all. This would be like flipping a coin 120 times and getting three heads. Question? Did they all have the same song? I don't actually remember. I think so. I think they went with a standard song that like everybody should know, like a nursery rhyme or something like that, that like culturally is common. They didn't go with some, you know, something that's on the popular radio because some people don't listen to radio. They didn't go with pop versus jazz, you know, like it's uh they went with something that everybody knew. I don't remember what it was though. I'll dig out the paper though if you're interested. She did her master's thesis on it, if I remember correctly. See, you can get paid money to do cool stuff. So how do we simulate this? Well, like I said, this is like flipping a coin 120 times. So that's what we're going to do because 50-50 is our thing. So what do you know this 50-50? Coins. Fair coins. If I take a coin and I flip it in a fair way, 50 heads, 50 tails, 50-50. Coin flips. So here's a way that we can do the coin flips. So some R code again, which the, these slides are up, so you can use this for your workshop to help you with simulating this problem. Sample from head tail. That's your population. Head tail, one flip. Okay, I got a head. Now what I do is I sample from it 120 times, and I use replacements true because I'm always flipping the same coin. I'm not like stealing the heads away so there's only tails left. It's head tail, head tail, head tail, head tail, 120 times, and then I sum. Now this is a bit, you actually have seen this syntax already, but you may have to think about it for a minute. This is a logical comparison. Remember your advanced subsetting? Still got five minutes, guys. Just hold it out. We're almost done. Experiment double equal H. That means are the elements of the experiment vector ahead? The return from this is a logical vector. Length 120. Because it goes through all the coin flips and says, are you ahead, are you ahead, are you ahead, are you ahead? The results are trues and falses. What happens when you sum a logical vector? Logicals get treated like integers, zeros and ones. Trues are ones, falses are zeros. So when I add it, I get how many trues there are. Again, it's a little, little hack, but it works. So I sum how many trues there are, divide that by 120, 54%. Okay, not 3%. Yes? I was just going to say, uh, would 
then you need something more sophisticated. Yeah. And that's where you use advanced subsetting that you learned in the last workshop. Let's put it together as an experiment 10,000 times. Flip it over and over and over again. So 10,000, cycle through, sample from this 120 times, take the sum, divide it. Here's some of the results we got. 51%, 50%, 55%, 50%, 49%, 48%, 45%. Not a lot of 2.5% in there. Let's plot this. That's the way to tell what's going on in a clean way. Oh, hello. This is all 10,000 samples. Where are we? Over there. There is not a single one of those 10,000 that's anywhere close to that. Of the 10,000 simulated experiments, zero of them, that's 0.00%, gave differences less than or equal to the 0.025. What do we conclude from this? We conclude from this that, in fact, it's not a 50-50 Tapper listener pair. That, <coughs> that is indeed false. The alternative has to be the case. The p-value is less than, now be careful. Your instinct is to say the p-value is zero. You don't actually know that. We ran 10,000 trials. We know it's less than one in 10,000. That's all you can say. And if you ran 100,000 trials, you could say less than one in 100,000 and so on, but you can't say zero because zero is very special in probability. It means absolutely could never happen. And I guarantee you, if we all sat here for a year, and flipped coins 120 times, eventually somebody would get three heads and 117 tails. It can happen. It's just really, really small. So it's not zero. It's less than one in 10,000 or this. So we do have strong evidence for rejecting the null. And so to conclude, the song that I was tapping was the Indiana Jones theme song. Do, 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 do. But all you're getting is... Have a good day.